Broadcasting live, it's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman. And everyone, hey, I hope you're doing well. So obviously today, I hope, uh, again, you're doing well and you had a great weekend. Today on the program, last minute change, but it's going to be okay because we have none other than NordVPN. They are a premier VPN provider, going to be talking all about VPNs, what they do, why they do, how they do, all that good stuff. Anything you want to know about VPN and why you should have one, this is going to be the show for you. And also, of course, we throw in some uh, just some security tips and some security statistics if you are interested about the state of cyber threats. Today is the show for you. So before we get started, a couple of things, including ComputerAmerica.com. That's where you'll find everything from today's show notes, a link to our guest website, any articles that we do, any news that we cover, just anything and everything will be at ComputerAmerica.com. Also, you'll find uh, some reviews. We have another one going up here shortly with a number of different devices. Uh, Well, actually, I should say accessories for devices. We just put up the Loom Cube. And by the way, if you were interested about the Loom Cube, you can, of course, check out Friday's show. If uh, Well, actually, I take it back. Not Friday. But uh, in the next week or two, yep, just looking at the calendar, in the next week or two, we should be having Loom Cube actually on the program to talk about the importance of, uh, you know, good lighting and what they do, how they do it. Uh, it's going to be good. So, everyone, thank you for tuning in to Computer America. Now, uh, in the second part of the program, we will be doing computer and technology news, including a topic of, you know, why... Uh, Uber drivers are going to strike. And uh, here's a pretty good hint. Looks like Uber will be cutting their wages by about 25%. Huge, huge cut. So we're going to figure out what happened, um, you know, why Uber drivers are thinking about striking today and more. So everyone, hey, one one last time, ComputerAmerica.com. Okay. Now, with that being said, everyone, why don't we go ahead and get into today's show? So, Now, today's guest, if you haven't heard of NordVPN, then that means, hey, you probably have not been looking for VPNs, which means this is going to be a very good show for you because we are going to discuss what a VPN is, how they work, what they do, and more specifically to NordVPN, uh, hey, you know, what are some of the benefits of using them and their services? It, this is just going to be a great show that we can point to later and say, hey, what, uh, you know, why you should consider, uh, you know, protecting yourself or protecting your business. This is going to be good. So joining us today is none other than Mr. Daniel Murkison, and he is the digital privacy expert for NordVPN. So let's go ahead, get him on. And uh, Daniel, thank you so much for joining us here on Computer America. Uh, thank you for having me. Hello. Yeah, perfect. And uh, uh, thank you for joining us. So obviously, this is uh, this is going to be something that I think people I, maybe five years ago I would have said ha- have not heard of a, of a VPN. But that's not the world we live in. I think a lot of people have heard the you know have heard of a VPN, but 
probably maybe don't use the ones themselves. So you're here to help us, you know, kind of navigate what this is and why people should be using it. Uh, but before we do that, let's go ahead and get some background on NordVPN. When was it started and, uh, and all that good stuff. And then a bit of yourself. How did you find yourself working with the company? Uh, okay. Um, so, I mean, I'm a bit hazy on the history. Uh, the company itself, I believe, was uh, founded around uh, 2012. Mm -hmm. um, there were just kind of four technology enthusiasts that came together to uh, create the company. Um, it was a technology that they had become, f uh, that is VPN specifically, something they had become familiar with uh, from kind of their own interests mm -hmm. and um, they they uh, I think it was that they created one for themselves at first and then they kind of saw the potential and and it really grew from there and um, I think actually one thing you said during the introduction was very very on point it was um, you know maybe five or ten years ago people might not have really known what this technology was and uh, certainly awareness of its benefits has been growing rapidly. Um, its application in people's everyday lives has been growing rapidly and that, uh, and, and kind of the public awareness of, of, you know, uh, all, all kinds of situations and events, um, that have made them more, made VPNs more relevant. Um, all of that has come together to just kind of catapult this technolo technology to a broader uh, market because it really did used to be more of a kind of technology geek type of thing or with very specific applications. And right. I think that's why the company uh, was, be able to grow, was, was able to grow uh, the way that it did. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I think it's not just, you know, as I said, consumers and things like that, but I, you know, we had or we have a correspondent who who worked for, uh, let's say, Autodesk. And, and I say, let's say, uh, you know, he, he did work for Autodesk and Autodesk, huge company, employees all, all over the world. They, like many other large companies, mandate that their, uh, you know, that their employees connect using a VPN. Uh, you know, just to make sure that the information flowing back and forth is encrypted, safe, and only the people who need the information are the ones who get it. So uh, in consumers' lives, hugely important for people who work from home, hugely important, and people who just value their privacy. This is uh, this is what we're going to do. So um, I, I think with, uh, you know, a couple of use cases that I just gave, I think you could do it better. What exactly is a VPN and uh, what users are are kind of using it and why are people using a VPN? Mm -hmm. um, right. So let's see. Give me a moment. Sure. At its most basic, uh, a VPN provides two things. Uh, it uh, obscures your location in the world and it obscures what you are the content of what you are sending online it does that by uh creating an encrypted tunnel between the device that has uh, your vpn software mm -hmm. and a vpn server and it does this by using uh, encryption. So, in you know, there are different kinds of encryption protocols and VPN protocols, but basically their goal is one way or another. Uh, they you have to exchange keys so that uh, you can lock the encrypted tunnel. You can think of it as let's say a, a, a safe. So you can lock it on one end on your device and unlock it at the VPN server. Um, and so that's essentially what any VPN does, and that's what our server does. Uh, when you get more VPN, you download the app, uh, and the app uh, has a key, and the server that you use as um, one of our uh, subscribers also has a key. And that ensures that everything between the server and the app is going to be uh, encrypted. And um, 
fortunately right now it's it's uh, not too difficult to provide encryption that is i mean nothing's nothing's 100% unbreakable but right. we can get about as as well yeah, yeah it, it, it's it, it's a matter of um i guess time versus effort versus you know kind of uh reward because i'm sure that you use something like i'm sure you can correct me uh aes 256 or something along those lines and it's not foolproof but who's going to spend 120 years uh trying to crack something that just might possibly maybe uh but most likely won't have anything of value to the person so yeah that's uh, exactly yeah. right yeah Yep. So it makes perfect sense. And uh, we can go ahead and we're going to get into the benefits of, you know, kind of obscuring your location or why people would want to do this and, uh, and everything that goes into it. But let's go ahead and talk about who some of your users yeah, actually sure. are. Okay. Um, uh, so, well, first I'll explain, I guess, the mechanism by which it hides your location. Basically, sure. Sure. Um, you're, uh, you are assigned an IP address when you connect to the internet, and that address is generally linked to, uh, with varying degrees of detail to uh, your location in the world. And what happens when you use a VPN is that your uh, IP address is one of the things that gets locked up in that locked uh, VPN tunnel. And when, um, and then when it comes out of the uh, VPN server on the other end, once it's unlocked, it's uh, your IP address is replaced with that of the server. Uh, so that's that effectively renders you, uh, at least in terms of your IP address, anonymous. Um, you know, there are other ways that you can give away your identity online, but uh, but I guess we can get to that later. Sure. Now, in terms of who uses or or. We have less information about who uses VPNs. We have more information about what they are used for, right. um, what they're good for. So it's actually quite, uh, let me, let me g give me a moment. Sure, go for it. It's quite a versatile tool uh, just because it's two primary applications are so uh, powerful. Um, you can, um, I mean, some people use it for accessing content um, that might be um, in one way or another dependent on their location. Right. Uh, some people, I think the most important usage is to secure information that you don't want anyone to see. I mean, we, um, we communicate a lot about this on our blog. One of the most vulnerable places uh, that you're, uh, um, where people send their information is across public Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. and a VPN will virtually eliminate that risk. Uh, and we've got a lot of very talented technical people uh, at our company who know exactly how easy it is to compromise someone's information or other personal details. Um, over public Wi-Fi. And so that makes it a really important tool for uh, travelers um, who, you know, if you're at the airport, you don't know who else is using that network. Uh, you don't know what sort of security measures it has in place. And especially if you're traveling on business, if you're sending important documents, sensitive documents, um, you need to make sure that that information is secured. Um, other applications uh, are um, in some parts of the world. Uh, the sharing of information is it, it can be limited. It can be uh, 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 censored. Um, and in countries like those, VPNs can be important tools for uh, uh, allowing people to communicate. Um, 
and and, and just real countries. quick, if you don't mind me, you know, kind of jumping in there, that is sure. a sticking point for a lot of these countries because now you're taking on, um, you know, governments, everything from, uh, you know, maybe Russia, maybe China, maybe the Middle East. I'm not saying that you know you have any kind of problem with any of these countries, but um, you are providing a tool that can give people kind of that workaround. We saw the rise and importance of VPNs during uh, events that happened, let's say, in the Middle East during Arab Spring. Uh, the government did everything in their power to shut down communication between people. And obviously, that is the opposite of what the internet is used for, which is connecting people. And VPNs became wildly important for you know, uh, you know, making sure people could communicate. Um, how do you handle, and, and I'm not talking about any particular instance, but uh, just in general, how do you handle government requests for, let's say, I don't know, uh, they ask you to turn off your services for a particular country, or they ask you to maybe identify your users. Uh, is there any kind of protocol? Do you just say that, hey, we offer the tool, how it's used, that's not, you know, that's not really in our purview, we're privacy, and that's that? Um how do you kind of handle the the legal side of this? Because, like I said, it can get complicated. Yeah. Um, so, one of uh, one of the big advantages of uh, how we have things set up is that uh, our company is uh, the the HQ is based in uh, Panama. Mm -hmm. And Panama has no laws in place that would demand. Uh, collecting any sort of uh, data about uh, our users or what they do while they use our service. And as a consequence, uh, we don't collect anything like that. That's that's basically, that's the gist of a uh, no logs policy, which is something we offer. We're not the only one in the market to offer it. Um, but what that means is if we have uh, infrastructure in, um, in countries that where the laws allow them to make those types of demands, mm -hmm. um, they can make those demands and we can, uh, well, you know, uh, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, right. I can't, right, right, right. This all, it's all personal. Essentially, essentially the point is they can, they can make those requests and, uh, we just don't have anything to give them because right. we don't collect anything. And, that's, and, and sorry for separating your toes again, but that's hugely important because obviously people who use a VPN, they're very concerned about their privacy and they don't want to, uh, they don't want a, a service that will, I guess, kind of violate that trust, violate that privacy at the drop of a hat. So that's hugely important and something I really wanted to make clear about, you know, when I, uh, when I interviewed you at NordVPN and I, and one other thing on top of that, that I wanted to, uh, you know, kind of make mention of, uh, and this actually is one of our, you know, questions that we were going to ask you anyways. Uh, there are a lot of VPN services out there that are free. There are VPN services that uh, you don't pay money for or pay a little bit of money. And some of them are quote unquote ad supported. Uh, VPNs, because I think it's a technology that uh, people are just now kind of getting used to, they maybe don't know how to choose a good one. They maybe don't know how to choose one that, uh, you know, that honors your privacy and it's not just, you know, redirecting your traffic. And we've even seen some news stories that have, you know, kind of reviewed VPNs. And, you know, by the way, happy to say, and that's kind of why we invite NordVPN on, because you guys do really good or do really well. Uh, but others, they're just kind of mask for, uh, I guess, kind of internet traffic sniffing and packet sniffing. And they're actually compromising your privacy while trying to promote privacy. Uh, let's go ahead and jump right into that. How to choose a good VPN for, you know, kind of the purpose of a VPN to protect your, your internet traffic. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it all comes around, you know, there's, there's a, there's no free lunch. Right. Um, the thing that we like to say is, you know, uh, when, when something online is, uh, free, 
then that means that you are not the customer, you're the product. Um, and yeah, uh, one way or another, they need to make money to you know, exist as a, as a company and, and they're going to figure out some way to do that. And that can be done in different ways that are more or less damaging to your uh, privacy. And that's kind of on the user to decide, you know, um, where that line lies for them. But the basically, yeah, if you want a VPN that truly respects your uh, privacy and security, uh, going for a paid VPN is going to be your best bet um, because they will have the infrastructure uh, and uh, they will have the, the people. Um, and I guess most importantly is that they will be responsible to you, not to whoever's paying their bills. Because, well, they will be responsible to whoever's paying their bills and that person is you, the user, not uh, somebody else. Um, I mean, in terms of free VPNs, some of them can overlay ads onto uh, the websites that you browse, right? which from a user standpoint, it may not be much of a difference, but what that would mean is that, uh, you know, if you visit a website that you love, um, then they're not going to be earning ad revenue off of, you know, your traffic. It's just going to be the VPN doing that. Uh, others do more unacceptable things like, um, you know, selling uh, user data to third parties, which then kind of partially defeats the purpose of using a VPN in the first place. Others will actually uh, use user bandwidth for other purposes. They'll sell other services as well uh, and then uh, split user bandwidth and kind of piggyback on your uh, bandwidth to provide some other clients with the service. Um, and then of course, it's just simply that generally it, I would personally, I would find it quite frustrating to use a product, uh, because they're all going to have paid versions anyway. And so they're going to, um, there's going to be limits to what you can do with their product. There's going to be time limits or bandwidth limits, uh, or data limits on what you can do with their product and all you need to achieve full functionality is to pay them the money that you would have paid to a premium VPN anyway. Yeah. So, um, I yeah, have run it's a, it's an option, but it's, it's yeah. far from the best one I would say. Yeah. I, I, I've run into that, uh, you know, tried out some, some free ones. And I got to say that when, when someone limits you to like, honestly, download speeds that I was getting in 1997, uh, fr more than frustrating. And obviously you just want to throw money at the problem until it goes away. But, uh, like I said, you know, finding reviews, finding a reputable, a, a rep wow, I'm sorry. Finding a reputable provider is hugely important because, uh, not all VPNs are made the same. In fact, just redirecting your traffic for, uh, you know, to one server to another is, actually pretty simple uh you know when you have it all set up and that's why you need to make sure that you do it well and by the way one thing i, I wanted to highlight uh this is a hugely important for you know maybe when you decide which vpn to choose something you should look at are the amounts of servers located in different parts of the world because if you're connecting in let's say you are a world traveler you're in south america you're in africa you're in you know southeast asia you're wherever and you're trying to get back to the united states if you're connecting to servers and the only server they have is in austin texas you're go you're going to get a lot of latency a lot of lag a lot of buffering if you're watching movies or videos uh it's going to be a pain in the neck. NordVPN really, really emphasizes that you guys have uh, servers in about 60 different countries. Why is that important? Yeah, um, so it's actually not just the number of servers that's important, it's also their uh, quality. Mm -hmm. um, we're actually working on, on, on something to showcase that, but so yeah, why the number of servers is, uh, okay, so the number of servers is important because uh, what that means is that you will always have a high probability of connecting to a server 
that is at uh, an optimal load, which is not too low and not too high. Um, and that just means that you're, uh, there's a better chance that you're going to have a good experience uh, because you won't be experiencing any sort of problems with the server being overloaded. Um, the other reason is, um, as you mentioned, the number of countries. Uh, we've put a lot of work into our infrastructure. And I mean, that makes the service more inclusive, more relevant for people around the world, uh, because you're absolutely correct. If you have to connect to a country that is far away from you, um, there are legitimate reasons for wanting to do that, for picking a specific country. But if all you need is to simply be covered by a VPN, period, then you want to connect either to your own country or to one as close to yours as possible. Um, and having a wider uh, selection of countries makes it more convenient both for users at home uh, and for people who travel. Uh, there's a better chance that the country that you're traveling to will have uh, one of our VPN servers there to make your experience uh, as, as uh, easy as possible. Um, then simply the fact this kind of touches on what we were talking before about free versus paid. Right. Uh, our servers are generally more powerful. Uh, we don't use uh, virtual servers. Uh, virtual servers, uh, I mean, there are a few security problems with them that I'm not going to get into. Mm -hmm. uh, but it certainly costs more to have the actual physical infrastructure everywhere. And, you know, that's part of what you get when, 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 you, uh, when you use a paid VPN. You get, you get the real deal. Um, Right. So, yeah, uh, basically it allows for flexibility, higher speeds, uh, quicker connection, um, just all around makes the service much, much better, much easier to, uh, easier to use, more convenient. So, and, and maybe this uh, is a good way to segue into our next question, which is, you know, trends that we've noticed over the past couple of years with VPNs. And you mentioned that some people, they just want to have a VPN just to, you know, have that encryption of their data, uh, regardless of what they're doing. They just want that protection. Uh, others need to appear that they're in different locations. Let's say that you are traveling out of the country, but you still want to watch your Netflix or something or Hulu or whatever any streaming service then hey you know you can make it look like you are back in you know back in your bedroom and you can watch whatever it is that you want to watch you know so on and so forth but i digress the the trends over the years of the vpn market um it used to and and i'm sure you can answer this better than i could but it seemed like just having a VPN was okay, but now it's about where the servers are, what uh, you, you actually use a VPN for. What are some of the trends that we've noticed and where are we at now with uh, with VPNs? Yeah, so I mean, at its broadest, uh, the trend in the market itself uh, has yeah. been uh, that it's uh, growing. And I guess the main reason for that would be all sorts of trends um, Kind of outside of the market, but uh, having to do with the uh, surveillance and privacy oh, and sure. security uh, spaces. So, um, one is simply the fact that uh, for certain people, um, things like uh, the uh, Edward Snowden revelations and a lot of what came uh, in the following years, uh, as well as things like uh, Cambridge Analytica. Mm -hmm have fostered a uh, deserved mistrust, I would say, certainly of, uh, of, of corporations and sometimes of governments as well, um, about whether uh, data is about people is being collected uh, appropriately, uh, whether it's being used appropriately, uh, whether it is being collected and used consensually, uh, and to what ends. Uh, so those issues, uh, once they've been brought to the forefront and people have started thinking about that, uh, some people have started thinking about solutions and really a VPN is a major part of, uh, of, of that. So, um, 
Yeah, and and I I will say that we just did an article a couple of days ago. Uh, it was the internet's thirtieth birthday. Uh, we did an article about Tim Berners Lee, who was the original engineer for the internet, and I, this you know, to really highlight it to our listeners out there. Uh, the internet was designed in a certain way. It gave certain information, such as your location and what you're doing, uh, the information that flows, that kind of thing. And I think thirty years later. Even Tim Berners-Lee, you know, the person who kind of, you know, came up with the whole idea, even he says that, hey, the internet needs to change. We're we're giving out too much information. It's not set up in an ideal way. And I think that is one of the reasons for VPN that, that we kind of see it is that any information that you leave hanging out there, companies have found a way to harvest it, collect it, categorize it, and sell it. And that's, you know, it like that was just a feature 30 years ago. Now it seems like 30 years later, that's the purpose of the Internet is to collect information about you. And not everyone Absolutely. agrees with that. And I think uh, there's one big issue. Um, uh, I guess something that hasn't been improving as as fast as we would like, although there's you know, uh, people's mindsets are really changing in other sentences, senses, is that um, a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, if, if, uh, if these companies gather my data and just use it to give me ads, like, okay, maybe ads are annoying, but like, you know, what's the harm in that? A few ads. Uh, the, the other trend that's really Greece been is illustrating cheap, that is the uh, rapid growth Not much in um, and again, airfare reaches, uh, the size of data Let's breaches, it, and, um, just too and kind of Wait, what can be done with a lot of the data. Uh, one call to low cost I mean, airlines. You'll drastically we've been having, I mean, last year was huge, uh, over a billion people any of your favorite uh, essentially you have like been affected, London, were affected Rome, by uh, Costa Rica. Australia? Uh, data breaches wow, that's uh, in 2018. So um, now to learn it's how crazy probably too early to, to say <laughs> that uh, statistic is going to be even so worse low. this year, we but um, the only I see no reason to doubt it. To We've had, uh, I the think, most amazing best deals on there's a breach of it's that easy. So call now 800 start million people, something like that, recently. Yeah, uh, and, and so, you know, what happens in a breach? So that data is collected from various places. That can be a malicious hack target a company 15, that can be someone just sniffing 61. around for poorly secured servers yeah. but oh, when Ten years ago, companies collect that data about you you're no longer in control change. of information that may or may not be important to you and you know many people don't think one step ahead it's like okay this company collected this data they're going to serve me some ads so what but you don't know if that company is going to be able to hold on to that data what if they so lose it a progress. year later and now still so uh, someone malicious has their hands on that data because these data trolls are bought and sold uh, uh, by hackers. Yeah. Uh, and then if someone has that data, you know, knowing all of that about you, what can they do? They can send you uh, an email uh, pretending to be a coworker or some service that you use. And they can defraud you of, you know, thousands of dollars, or they can break into, you know, your bank, your online banking account, depending on what kind of data was uh, in that trove. Uh, people really uh, open themselves up to a lot of serious vulnerabilities, and even as more and more of what we do goes online, uh, with the apps that we use and the services that we use online. Um, and that's really what we've been trying to communicate uh, is, you know, the problem with this and how people have to be more aware of their uh, uh, data security. Right. And, and and beyond that, I mean, we we really only hear uh, in the news and trust me, we cover the news plenty here on the show. I remember that eight, uh, 800 million uh, or let's say three billion from Yahoo or so on and so forth. I mean you only hear about the ones that kind of reach uh, maybe like an, a, an Equifax level. But um, even beyond that, people get hacked all the time. People click on links, people, you know, click on banner ads that they shouldn't. And yeah, you know, they get redirected. They get, um, you know, th they get things put on their computer. It happens on a personal level all the time. So 
even if you're concerned about companies, maybe you should be concerned about, you know, kind of your own browsing habits. And we can, uh, you know, in just a minute, talk about some simple steps people can take to be more safe. But uh, before we do that, let's go ahead and talk about, um, you know, really put a, a good pin in this and say people tend to not care about cybersecurity as they think that they are not important enough to be tracked and have nothing to hide. You know, as I said, uh, the individual may be just the average, uh, you know, person who just browses and emails and streams and whatnot. Um, maybe people really don't know the importance of being secure. Uh, what would you say to them? Yeah. Um, so when we talk about a hacker, right, and we talk about him hacking into someone's account and doing something, we imagine someone sitting down on a computer and saying, uh, today, I'm going to sit down and hack John Doe, this individual. It doesn't really work that way. What they do is they collect these troves of data. And instead of, you know, I guess I can use phishing as an example. Instead of phishing with a phishing rod, they're phishing with you know commercial ships with dragnets that are miles long. Mm -hmm. uh, they it's not personalized to them. They they you know it's nothing personal to them. Um, they just get the data. They see what sticks. They send out. Uh, they either try to they test passwords to millions of accounts. Uh, they send out uh, thousands of these uh, social engineering emails based on persona, uh, uh, personalized data and they just see what sticks. So the idea that you're too small to be a target, it's right and wrong. No one's targeting you individually, but if you have poor uh, data security, then you're going to be one of the fish that gets caught in the net. Uh, it just increases your likelihood. Um, and really that makes it scarier because what it means is it doesn't matter how small you are, uh, you're still definitely, definitely someone's going to be coming after you, uh, but just not personally, not on an individual one-on-one -on -one level. That's far less uh, common. Uh, a lot of these uh, methods seem to be rather, you know, like dragnets. Right. And, and by the way, uh, you know, because I feel like I'm, I'm, you know, we've already overgone, uh, you know, kind of what I promised here. But I hope you don't mind. We're gonna go, you know, go ahead and go long. And I do want to say one thing that maybe turns people off of the idea of you using a VPN is that maybe they think it's is, is technical. You know, it's um, uh, talking about networks and servers and you know that kind of thing. It's something a little bit beyond the average consumer. But I don't think that you made your product for only network engineers. No, this, you know, NordVPN is for everyone, I assume. So talk about just actually using your product, NordVPN. Is it a client you download? Is it something that you load up to your router? How do you use it? Uh, you know, maybe walk us through uh, signing up, paying for NordVPN, and then how do we, you know, get protected? Sure. Um... So, I mean, sign up and payment, that's going to be simple as I, as I think it would be with absolutely anything. You go to the website, you create your account, you pay. We offer a few um, kind of uh, privacy-oriented payment methods as well that allow the, uh, the user to stay uh, even more uh, completely anonymous. Um, then you have your account created. Uh, you download the app to the device of your choice. We uh, support quite a few. Uh, there's also ways to um, configure our service to work through your, uh, via, through your router. Uh, we've got an article about that, but I guess most people but, uh, are going to be using it through their devices. We support uh, six devices uh, per user account. Uh, so that really lets you, you know, you either cover your whole family or cover a whole bunch of different accounts. Uh, but six, uh, sorry, not six devices, I guess it's better to say six simultaneous users. Okay. So you can have it on more devices. Um, and then using the app itself is just dead simple. I, our team has done great work on that. Uh, 
There are settings you can toggle uh, that will allow more advanced users to have more control over how the service works or if, uh, if you're having some sort of specific issue then uh, our 24-7 uh, support team can walk you through it. But uh, otherwise, uh, you, you can, it's, it's, it's a one button show really. You open up the app, you click on connect uh, and it tells you when it's done connecting and that's it, you're protected. Uh, and then if you want, you can uh, figure out how to change which country you connect to, which type of specialized server you do or don't want to connect to. Um, it really gives you a lot of opportunities to, to turn up or dial back how involved you are in the way the service works. Right, yeah, and I'm seeing here you clearly label which servers are peer-to-peer, -peer, which are, uh, you know, other different kinds of settings. I'm not even going to try to say the word off, uh, off, off, not even going to try it. But, yeah, so obviously, uh, you know, every server is not the same, but you clearly mark which ones are, you know, maybe have different features. So, makes perfect sense, and like you were kind of saying, very easy to do you know not not complicated at all so makes perfect sense and then maybe we'll cap off this interview with um maybe some other things that people can do to keep themselves safe obviously uh i'm sure that a, a representative from nordvpn would recommend getting a vpn but uh what are simple steps that people can take to be safe online um yeah uh we've got I mean, we've got uh, a blog with a whole lot of tips. I would say one thing that's really shocking. I mean, when we when when we talk to some of the technical guys that do a lot of research into like the threats, uh, the actual the, that that you know white hat uh, hackers uh, as they're called, mm -hmm. um, people's password hygiene has a lot of catching up to do uh, in terms of like in terms of how many data breaches there are. So every time a data breach happens, uh, and let's say it's for a website you used, and you think, oh, uh, I don't mind about that account, but then you think about how many times have you used the same password elsewhere, uh, and they might sim they might understand that, and then they'll use, for example, the email address from your account on one website, try to use that with your password on another website that's more problematic that you didn't think of. And they'll be able to log in if you use the same password. So that's a big one. Using different passwords for different uh, services and websites online. Using strong and unique passwords. Uh, the optimal goal is to create a long, unique password that's easy for you to remember. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to do that. We've got them, uh, I, I think, to get more tips um, in our time. I'm not going to go into depth sure. here, but uh, there are all kinds of tricks to create really good passwords that you won't forget. Um, if you use an online service that offers uh, two-factor authentication or verification, um, pretty good idea to turn that on because of what that means is that even if a hacker gets the full details to log into one of your accounts, uh, they would need to also have access to your physical device and if they don't have it, they can't complete a login and they can't get at your uh, important data. Um, I think Internet of Thing devices are a big question mark. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, I don't think there's enough investment into the security options behind these devices. Um, as I mentioned earlier, public Wi-Fi is a really big issue. It's really shocking how easy it can be to get uh, meaningful data right. about someone. Uh, just over Wi-Fi, uh, especially if they're uh, using an unsecured channel. Um, so if you have to connect to public Wi-Fi, uh, make sure you have something securing your uh, communications, ideally a VPN. Right. Um, yeah. In terms of security, those are probably some of the big ones. Privacy is much broader. Uh, there's a lot of different things you can do. Um, I don't know if you want to get into that as well. Uh, yeah, we we have about five minutes left. I think we can hit some you know some some of the key parts of privacy. But I uh, you know I do just kind of want to highlight some of the points that you made uh, here on the show. We always recommend uh, 
password managers. You know, uh, creating those long string complex passwords, uh, you know, can be you know kind of challenging. We recommend password managers. None of them pay us right now, so we don't recommend any. Just whichever one strikes your fancy, and. Uh, you know, like you said, just, you know, open public things. Uh, actually, one of the one of the co-hosts of the show a, a little while ago was himself a white hat hacker. And he made it very clear just how much information you can give away by connecting to the wrong uh, Wi-Fi server. So, uh, yep, everything you just said, completely, completely agree. Something that we've said here on the show before. Uh, yeah, so let's spend a couple minutes and then, you know, and then we're going to wrap this up. But let's spend a couple minutes about privacy. Yeah, um, I think using a lot of the online services that we love, uh, it's easy to forget that every single thing you do down to often even the movement of your mouse is uh, being tracked. Mm -hmm. And to kind of get into that uh, experience and, and, you know, if you're just talking to one other person, you might feel like it's private, but it's really not. So it's just kind of keeping that in mind and uh understanding what you do and don't share uh online and which channels are secure and which are not uh and that actually requires quite a bit of research looking into alternative tools we've got a lot of information about that on our blog um about alternative browsers uh because many of the most popular browsers not all of them uh are affiliated with uh or or directly created by companies uh, that are interested in in uh, collecting a lot of your data uh, and there are browsers that um, absolutely cut off that, uh, or in many different ways can cut off th those uh, tracking methods. Um, I mean, given the amount of online services we use, uh, it's, I think, really time for people to understand how important it is to un really understand how the internet works and get more familiar with tools, get familiar with terms like uh, um, like cookies and HTTPS and, and VPN. Um, all of those are things that are important to consider. I would never put my purchase information, I would never buy anything from a website that is not HTTPS secured. Um, and what that is, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a protocol that allows, um, end-to-end -end encryption between your browser and and the uh, the website that you're using. Uh, so it's very important for security. Well, and, um, and, and you know, uh, I'm going to step in here real quick because this, this is something that we actually had to do for, for Computer America because, uh, you know, while we don't take any payment or things like that at the show, uh, it affects your, your search ranking and, you know, having HTTPS, super important. It also says that a third party has verified that when you go to ComputerAmerica.com, uh, we are indeed ComputerAmerica.com and someone else didn't just take uh, a copy of our website put it up and then, you know, maybe in the ads or the search field or a place where you, you would put your credit card, which there are none. Uh, let's say someone just took a copy of amazon.com and as soon as you put in your account information, it's actually stolen. You're not actually at Amazon and congratulations, you're not compromised. HTTPS, super important. So just want to make that clear. Absolutely. Um, yeah. There's that, there's uh, kind of uh tracking cookie hygiene, mm -hmm. uh, you know, clearing them regularly. Um, there's managing the settings on your mobile device uh, to see what is and isn't tracking you. Um, it's important to keep apps on your mobile device and on your desktop, on really any device you have to keep them updated because when security researchers discover a, uh, a vulnerability, Mm -hmm. That is that's publicized usually more in the security community than it is uh, to the public in general, and then the security community responds by releasing updates to uh, devices. And that uh, if you don't update your device, uh, there's a decent chance that there's a publicly revealed vulnerability to your device uh, that everyone knows about and uh, that someone could use against you until you uh, install that update. Uh, so those are really important. Uh, it's important not to put them off. 
Right. And and just to be clear, everyone, uh, a lot of the, you know, a lot, let's say the WannaCry ransomware or the Equifax hack or a lot of these huge, huge, huge uh, breaches, a lot of them are because of poor password hygiene, like you mentioned earlier, Daniel, or uh, or because uh, operating systems were not updated to the latest version and just very well-known, well-publicized vulnerabilities hey, they affect billions of systems around the world. Uh, so I, I, I'm happy to say that everything you've said, uh, we certainly advocate here on Computer America, but hey, um, no matter how many times you say it, someone out there is not going to listen. So repeat, repeat, repeat everything you said, great information. And I want to thank you so much for, uh, for providing it. And thank you for coming on and telling us about VPNs, NordVPN, and just really highlighting the, the idea that, you know, even though you are, are using the internet, privacy is still possible. And I want to thank you so much. And I want to thank NordVPN. I want to thank you, everyone, Mr. Daniel Markison. He is the digital privacy expert for NordVPN. And thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having us. Our pleasure, our pleasure. So, hey, we'll certainly be in touch and, uh, and, hey, and, and have a great day. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, you too. All right, have a Bye-bye. good one. Bye-bye. All right, everyone, so we're going to go ahead and continue on here. We're going to do computer and technology news in like these last, oh, 10 minutes. Everyone, here we go. Computer and technology news. Now, everyone, uh, we're going to do computer and technology news. And this is, of course, brought to you by Computer America. Here we go. And let's see. Hey, there's the jingle. Now, for today, our uh, our stories are mainly going to consist of, and I won't lie, about Apple. Uh, only have a couple minutes here, so we're going to try to get through as much Apple news as we can. Apple had a large had a large event, and they announced a couple of things that are pretty new, pretty interesting. And uh, I think we're going to start with uh, the first one, and then move on to the second, if that's okay with all of you. So now, the first one is that Apple has announced that they will be uh, debuting. An Apple Card credit card. That's right. This is not simply Apple Pay. If you recall, Apple Pay found on most Apple devices lets you tie in a card from MasterCard, Visa, what have you, uh, much like Samsung Pay or whatever kind of uh, near-field communication pay you can think of. And in lieu of starting with another bank account and that kind of thing, of course, you know, in the article, we should we should see if uh, this is backed by anyone else, but. Apple will be your card provider, not MasterCard, not Visa. So here we go. This is the article from Engadget, and again, covering today's big Apple event, saying that they have announced Apple Card credit card coming in summer 2019, so just a few months away. To get an Apple card, users will be able to sign up with their iPhones in the Apple Wallet app and get a digital card that can be used anywhere Apple Pay is accepted within minutes. So to be clear, they don't send you a physical card. This is strictly an Apple virtual credit card. Or I should say probably closer to a, well, I think back, it is a credit card. Uh, Customers will be able to track purchases, check balances, and see their bill is due right from the app. There, there will be a physical titanium card too, but there's no credit card number, CVV, expiration date, or signature. All of the authorization information is stored directly on the wallet app. So I guess the titanium card is strictly for swiping where they don't have wireless pay. Apple also says that it use, that it will use machine learning and Apple Maps to label stores that use the app and use the data to track purchases across categories like food and drink and, of course, shopping. Instead of a points-based reward system, as many cards are want to do, instead they will be doing cash back where they will be offering Apple Pay and Apple Daily Cash, I guess not Apple, but Daily Cash is what it's called, where they will offer where they will offer you 2% cash back through purchases and 3% cash back from Apple. There you go. Uh, purchases made through the physical card will get a 1% cash back. So no points, just money back. And if you're watching the video portion, you can see here that they uh, what the physical titanium card would look like. Uh, As rumored, Apple has partnered with Goldman Sachs for the Apple Card and with MasterCard for handling payment processing. 
So Apple isn't in this alone, Goldman Sachs for the bank, MasterCard for the payment processing. Additionally, the company is promising that there will be no late fees, no annual fees, no international fees, and no over limit fees. With the Apple Card in lower interest rates, with no penalties for missing payments, with APR rates ranging from 13 to 24 percent, uh, based on credit, and uh, yeah, there you go. The company also notes that late or missed payments will result in additional interest accumulating towards the customer's balance. So we're not going to get into how a credit card works. If you're interested in that, Google credit cards, but. This is very much a credit card, and uh, yeah, hey, now all through Apple Pay. Really, this makes me think this is what Apple Pay was intended to be the entire time, but they're finally rolling out with it. And I definitely do like the fact that they're going to have a physical card as well. Very, very Apple-like of them. Now, that was just one announcement. There's another one. Let's go ahead and move on to Apple TV Channels. And that's the name of the service, if you didn't catch today's event. Apple TV Channels is an a la carte way to watch your favorite networks. And you can see a number of them there, but here we go. Apple TV Channels, the company has created a way for you to pick and choose your favorite networks and watch everything within its TV app. And by the way, the Apple TV app received a huge update. Now, the selection includes traditional channels like CBS and Comedy Central, so there you go, and premium networks like HBO and Showtime, as well as online streaming services like BritBox and Acorn TV. Eh. And the crowd goes mild. On top of giving you a single spot to watch all this content, you'll be able to download shows and movies to your device and watch uh, to watch online and offline. So you'll. So what about all the original content that we've been hearing about? That'll be an Apple TV Plus, which is a separate service that uh, that Apple announced today, and we're also going to cover that one next. But it's kind of unfortunate to hear about Apple TV channels, and they're splitting that from Apple TV Plus, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But there you go. Apple is also clearly targeting Amazon Prime video channels, which, which another way to, I'm sorry, which was another way to, to subscribe to premium networks. It's also bringing the TV app to Macs and smart TV brands, so you'll be able to watch Apple channels on devices like uh, beyond your iPhone and iPad. Back at CES, we were surprised to see AirPlay headed to several smart TV makers, and of course, iTunes on Samsung TV. Now it's all making sense. And unfortunately, you know, looking through uh, Apple TV channels and they have a bunch of logos up here in the image. uh, Sure, there's Stars, Showtime, HBO, you know, and and Cinemax right there in the middle. That's great. But then you get these weird things like uh, like the History Channel Vault. You get uh, Nick Hits instead of Nickelodeon. You get uh, the Smithsonian Channel Plus. Like you get all these services or at least channels that like, Sure, it's CBS, but it's CBS All Access, so you get like uh, a limited amount of the catalog available to you. So I don't feel like this is this is going to be anything that the cable comp- that, that the cable industry is really worried about. Obviously, Apple has worked closely with them. This is more of like a back catalog of your favorite television stations that you can then subscribe to through Apple. And so, as for price, everyone rumors that it will be uh, ten dollars for uh, you know ten dollars a month. And of course, you could see where this may be interesting because uh, if it's ten dollars a month and HBO Go, which is HBO, which will be included in this, uh, is fifteen dollars a month, it'd be cheaper if you already have HBO Go. Then hey. Uh, may just be cheaper just to go with this. That is, of course, unless you have to subscribe to each one individually, which would really just kill this whole service. But we will find out more about that. Okay, time, real quick, one more. Apple TV Plus, and we'll figure out what this is. So Apple TV Plus is, and this is uh, CEO Tim Cook announced Apple TV Plus, an ad-free subscription home for the company's new push into original content. There you go. 
With Apple TV app now extending onto other smart TV platforms, as you just mentioned, other smart TVs, and of course, Macs, uh, while collecting shows and movies from other outlets into channels, it's giving people even more of a reason to stick with Apple by adding exclusives you can't get anywhere else. Exclusive, by the way, is something that Netflix has done exceedingly well at. So obviously, this is where uh, Apple kind of seeds its competition. Now, According to Senior VP Ed Q, Apple TV Plus will be home to some of the highest quality original storytelling that TV and movie lovers have seen yet. We've heard a lot about its content buying spree over the last year or so, but on stage, execs kick things off with a video featuring big names like Steven Spielberg, Ron Howard, and Octavia Spencer. Spielberg himself appeared on stage to talk about Apple TV Plus and the stories he wants to tell. Bet you Apple paid a pretty penny for Spielberg, but there you go. Reese Witherspoon and Jennifer Aniston showed up to talk about their new project, The Morning Show, along with co-star Steve Carell, before Alfie Woodward and Jason Moma hit the stage to talk about C, a new science fiction series coming to the service. Pretty big names. Apple obviously not afraid to drop the big names. Uh, yeah, and there you go. So, uh, uh, Kumal Nanjiani was up next discussing his experience as an immigrant as part of a new series, Little America. So everyone, the music in the background means that we are flat out of time, but you can see here, there's going to be a lot of different content coming, including some new, uh, some new Sesame programming and so much more. Hey, it's kind of one of those things you're going to have to wait and see. And also, of course, they said Oprah, as expected, she will join forces with Apple to serve this moment. So Oprah also coming back to Apple TV+. Plus. Everyone, we're flat out of time. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, NordVPN, for coming on the show and describing your service. Everyone, thank you out there for joining us on today's show. If you miss any part of it, wherever podcasts are heard, go check it out. And in the meantime, we will catch you here. Same time, same place, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern, Monday through Friday. And uh, yeah, have a great weekend or great week. Everyone, have a good one. Bye-bye.